equal importance. So I'm going to talk more about um, welfare state than liberal neutrality. Um, so what remains uh, about the, the, the title, what I think it's a, an intractable um, issue, a very complex issue, has to do with, has to do with uh, positive rights. Um, and I mention this because you will probably find my talk more uh, a, a list of, of questions, more a framework to think about this uh, issue of, of giving public aid uh, to um, companion animals, guardians. Um, more, it's, it's going to be more that, a, a framework to think about it, than a list of, of fully um, developed answers. Um, okay. So thinking uh, philosophically about non-human animals uh, make us think uh, about ourselves, our moral and legal conceptual apparatus, and about our institutional framework. Uh, children is a test case for any theory of rights. That's what notoriously said um, a legal theorist, Neil McCormick. And non-human animals are certainly a test case for um, our idea about rights, equality, freedom, justice, and lately for uh, citizenship and um, welfare rights. Um, personhood is a moral property, as it has been said all along the conference, that enables us to claim rights in the form of certain immunities. But there's also the dimension of being able to develop morally significant attachments to bounded communities and territories. Um, and this is what the idea of citizenship encapsulates, and that now it has been extended to domesticated animals by uh, these two very prominent and well-known uh, political philosophers, Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicum. So when we think about non-human animals, uh, personhood, citizenship, one very natural way to do so is by means of analogy, this sameness strategy that Laurie Grun uh, talked about this morning, um, questioning whether there are morally relevant different differences between us and the rest of animals that justify differentiation. But animals have... Um, also been a wonderful source of reductio ad absurdum arguments. That's the formal structure of, of that sort of arguments for denying equal treatment. Mm. If women were bearer of rights, animals would also be. That was the main tenet of, of, of this gentleman, Thomas Taylor, in the um, Vindication of the Rights of Brutes, 1792. It is quite common also, at least in my home country, Spain, when, when the uh, same-sex marriage, uh, this legal reform was discussed, to point out as an absurdity the possibility of interspecies marriage, as a way of saying, how can same-sex people get married? Um, if animals were bearer of rights, we would have to stop predators from eating their prey. That was the main argument um, presented by David Rich uh, in 1895 in Natural Rights, um, an argument that has been recently endorsed by Jeff McMahon. Some animal, so-called animal liberationists are led to the conclusion that we should extinct wild animals, and that is an absurd conclusion, for example, for Donaldson and, and Kimlicum. Okay, so I'm going to skip more absurdities. Um, sometimes the analogies, as you know, prompt bitter controversies. Um, the well-known uh, philosopher Eva Feather Kite um, accuses, um, argues that 
non-speciesist moral individualism leads, that has been defended by Jeff McMahon, leads to a conclusion which is self-evidently abhorrent, the basis, Kitai says, for an argument ad absurdum, not a thesis to maintain. In this controversy, Peter Singer has also um, participated. But on the other hand, and interestingly enough, we witness a certain alliance between advocates for disabled people and the non-human animal cause. Anita Silvers, a very well-known advocate and philosopher of disability from San Francisco, has said, and I quote, some non-human animals thus can be active participants in shaping principles that nurture a climate of trust despite, despite their inability to reason about the principles their behavior both suggests and endorses. Justice for animals thus can be seen as important to building confidence in and commitments to human justice. Okay, this uh, alliance, sort of alliance, stems from a combination of, of factors. Um, recent literature on disability has insisted first on our intrinsic dependency. Um, and there are a number of philosophers in, in, in this trend. Um, Kelly Oliver was mentioned this morning by, by Jim Boddington. Um, a very well-known American philosopher, McIntyre, has written that, and I quote in full, the virtues that we need if we are to develop from an, our initial animal condition into that of independent rational agents, and the virtues that we need if we are to confront and respond to vulnerability and disability, both in ourselves and in others, belong to one and the same set of virtues the distinctive virtues of dependent rational animals, whose dependence, rationality, and animality have to be understood in relationship to each other." End of quote. Secondly, um, the idea that disabilities are mainly socially constructed. From that realization derives the idea that personhood is a relational concept, the capacity to stand in certain relationships with other persons. Um, this is something which has been also stressed by Eva Feather Kite, but Kite still builds this uh, concept in a specialist fashion. We care, she says, and should care, because we all humans are some mother's child. Well, granted, although if we trace back far enough in our past, we, animals, are, all have a common one. Each of us is some eukaryota cell's child. <laughs> Even if we um, remove this speciesist account of the notion of dependence, the relational approach still suffers from two problems. First, in the case of severely mentally disabled people, the disability doesn't seem that it stems from social conditions. And secondly, relations does not exhaust personhood in the sense that they are not a sufficient condition. The existence of certain capacities, intrinsic capacities, seem necessary. When we think about domesticated animals or companion animals, an immediate analogy comes to mind, and that is human procreation, Henry Salt um, at the end of the 19th century. This uh, path has been followed also but by more recent um, authors. There are some facts and figures there that you probably know better than I do about um, the, the fact, this, this reality of living with um, companion animals. So domesticated animals, like children, stand in 
an asymmetrical, imperfect, reciprocal relation. And like children, they have no chance to exit the relationship. Is that regrettable, as some animal liberationists claim? This asymmetry that holds in both cases has been defended as something that boosts unique goods for individuals and that justifies certain parental immunities against the state, namely that we rely on families in order to nurture children. So we don't think that we should re redistribute children to whom might suit best as a parent. Also, when we justify not precluding people from having children with impairments, provided their lives are worth living. In our days, at least in our societies, children are not events, but decisions. And the same might go with domesticated animals. Contrary to the uh, ex uh, extinctionists' claim, the state of dependency itself is not morally wrong. What is wrong is the means or the intent. The love and care that many humans direct to their animal companions is not misdirected sentiment to be despised, but a powerful moral force <coughs> to be harnessed and expanded. This is what Donaldson and Kim Lika argue in the uh, Soho Police book that I uh, mentioned before. For Martha Nussbaum, for example, one of the capabilities which is central to human beings is being able to live with concern for and in relation to animals. And yet, children, human procreation is a public affair. We share the efforts of nurturing human children why? Mainly because they sort of return the investment. They're, they are children, albeit contingently, a public good. This justification, however, is of no use with some of our children, particularly those who suffer from severely impairing mental conditions. And yet, it is claimed that a decent society should pay for their needs of care, education, etc. We talk about public provision for the payment of caregivers or even financial resources that allows less wealthy families not to recourt to abortion in the case in which it is known or diagnosed that the child will suffer from severe mental disabilities. Severely disabled people are, or, are also everlasting dependent as non-human animals, as domesticated non-human animals. Although, arguably, as opposed to non-human animals, they have suffered, it is said, a misfortune. <laughs> That might be a justification for their being incorporated in the community as citizens and for providing public support. Um, but why the misfortune of not suffering a human misfortune and still be dependent would not give equal status of citizenship to domesticated animals? As a matter of fact, vulnerability and dependency have been typically posed as justifications of positive rights, and the family institution as the paradigmatic mirror of the welfare state. Under this model, uh, we might have responsibilities also to protect domesticated animals. This is the path taken by Donaldson and Kimlicka explicitly as regards to domesticated animals, and only as regards to them. Dependence is the reason, but dependence um, cuts both ways. They are dependent. Non-human non animals are 
companion animals are dependent on us, but some of us are dependent on them. That is clearly the case with the so-called service animals and therapy um, animals. So as regards to those, to, to, to therapy animals or service animals, first we have a problem of access. So the claim raised by some human beings that are dependent on them, that are asking for permission to keep their um, relation. Miniature horses, for example, are um, preferred by some blind people, some disabled people, and they get huge barriers to, to have them, to have them um, enter the public sphere. These are negative rights, uh, but there's no free lunch in providing this sort of adaptation and access. But think in the cost of training a, a capuchin, um, uh, which in, in, in helping hands, these organizations that train them in order to help quadriplegic people, uh, the, the cost raises up to uh, 30, $38,000. Who should pay for that? This can be seen in a rather commodifying way as part of the cost of health care for disabled people. We provide wheelchairs, therefore we should provide guiding dogs for blind people. But what about health care for the domesticated animal? Or education? Is it not a matter of education to provide is it not a matter of justice to provide that sort of education? If we're going to attribute citizenship to domesticated animals, as Donaldson and Kimlicka say, say we should do, at least we have to instruct, if not educate them. For a city dog, learning to take the subway or to activate accessible door devices or learning the niceties of where to defecate may all be relevant capabilities. I'm approaching the end. So further questions. The problem of persistent discrimination. Should we stick to this great divide between wild animals and companion animals? And even between wild animals, some of them are very well treated, like the bald eagle, um, which is your national symbol, gets very special protection whereas other wild animals are not as protected. The problem of, it should say, intra-species equality. If domesticated animals can flourish, as Nussbaum, for example, contends, should we be concerned with equalizing their very different opportunities to flourish? This I would refer as the aristocrats' problem. So some domesticated cats live in much better conditions that, that, than others. Uh, should we care about that? The sharing of the costs, of course. Sue Donaldson and Will Kimlicka have plausibly argued that the number of domesticated animals should be socially and eco ecologically sustainable. Should the state be on command? Should the state redistribute redistribute, domesticated animals? By which criterion? caring capabilities, a proper environment, which is very likely what only wealthy human beings can provide. And what about if, if we think um, more globally and consider the needs of millions of human beings, particularly children, on Earth? When it comes to medical care, it's better to be a sick cat in the middle class US household than a sick peasant in a third world country. That's what Richard Epstein has claimed. This makes me wonder if what is this final um, thought, if what is at stake is the possibility of having a family, sort of a family relation broadly understood, should the adoption of a needy human infant comes first? Thank you very much. <laughs>